Welcome everybody. I'm Steve Lentini and I'm your host for Different Thinking for Different Times. And I have a special guest today, Peter Alberding, and he's from Massachusetts. And he's got an interesting background and you know why I do this podcast. It's been over five years now. And for those of you that listen on a regular basis, you know that I like to have people that can remind us of, to have some different thinking, not small minded thinking, right? The, what I use as the logo and the trademark is the acorn brain, right? We've been trained by caveman days to have some thoughts that are based on instincts. And while that's still somewhat necessary, I mean, if you're walking down a street and turn down an alley and somebody's following you, you might pay attention to fear, but we have far less to fear today. We live in an amazing world and created by uh, a force that's beyond our minds, beyond anything we can imagine. And you know, I share my experience about leaving this world to what's next. And uh, that's what gave me the idea that we have a lot of work to do and that's our job is to overcome our small minded thinking and do good. And how do you feel when you do good? Everyone I ask, except for one guy a few years ago, says they feel good. They feel great when they do good. And that one guy said, uh, I guess I feel good. He, he was reluctant to share how good he felt. Uh, and there's a reason we feel good when we do good. And so with that, I'm going to go to Peter. And Peter, welcome. Thank you very much for having me, Steve. Happy to be here. Yeah, I'm grateful that um, you were referred to me by a dear friend of mine, Paul Scolio. And uh, so tell us about um, your background, what you're up to and what you think is important and what you want people of this podcast to take away. Sure. Well, I'm uh, what am I? I'm a 58 year old man married to my wife, Lynn, for the last 30 something years. We've got three uh, children aged 22, 26 and 27. So two of them out of college and one uh, one in her last year. I got a couple of engineers and a and uh, our oldest is uh, working on Wall Street. Um, we live in a suburb of Massachusetts. I have, uh, I'm sitting in my office right now where I have my dog, uh, Moose, who's a 19-month-old black lab right behind me. He's out of the camera, but he's, my, uh, he's a constant companion of mine. Um, I have uh, grew up in Chicago, um, went to college in the East Coast, was a uh, Division three basketball player and a history major and got into the financial services firm not too long after uh, college. I primarily worked at, at, at uh, two firms my entire career. Uh, I worked for a large Swiss bank and spent some time living and working in Switzerland, which was a terrific experience. And um, for the last uh, 10 or 11 years, I've worked at Raymond James. My business partner and I have a wonderful of uh, uh, wealth management practice where we work with a hundred or so families and, and um, provide a lot of financial planning resources and investment management and have uh, have had a very nice career and have, you know lovely children who have uh, you know grown into adulthood and are, are making their way and it's that's quite rewarding on the um, on the personal side, I, I uh, play a lot of music and uh, I spend a lot of time working with a, yeah, and I spend a lot of time working with a nonprofit organization. I'm a, on the executive committee and the bo board member of uh, an organization called Silver Lining Mentoring, which provides a variety of uh, mentoring and other services to youth in the foster care system in Massachusetts. Um, that's a, a topic I could spend a lot of time talking about. It's a, uh, you know, a population of, uh, children and young adults who through no fault of their own have ended up in a, you know, a, a state system that is trying to provide care for them and, um, resources are pretty limited. And, uh, what silver lining does, uh, is to provide, one-on-one uh, uh, -on -one mentoring, so sort of think of big brother, big sister type of arrangement, one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring for youth in foster care and provide lots of services. For example, how do you get a driver's license? How do you open a bank account? 
How do you uh, how do you interview for a job? You think of all the things that children and young adults learn at the dinner table or through their parents, um, where they don't have this opportunity. And and those are the a, a few examples of um, what we try to do and and sort of the leadership and education we try to provide for a population of you know, young, innocent people who are otherwise uh, frequently overlooked in our society. How many uh, kids are in the foster system in Massachusetts? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I frequently I ask that question to people who are curious. I say, how many, how many, how many youth do you think are in the foster care system in Massachusetts? And it's, I'd say it's about four thousand or so. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's a, it's, there is, you know, there's, there's more demand than we can meet in terms of, you know, the needs. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple of examples about sure. what the challenges are. Um, a, a, a youth in the foster care system uh, may be there for a variety of reasons. Um, parents who are, have given them up, parents with criminal or drug issues, um, not infrequently, it's it's uh, youth who are um, gay or lesbian or transgender, and parents can't necessarily deal with it. As <laughs> uh, shocking as that might be, yeah. and um, the the average uh, young person in foster care will move three or four times a year. Like, um, I think many people think, oh, foster system is you go and live in a home with parent with, you know, foster parents who are trying to help you. Yes, that happens. The the majority of uh, youth in foster care are living in group homes, and um, what will happen is the Department of Youth Services will show up and say, hey, pack your bags, we're, you know, you're moving today. So they're changing schools, they're changing environments, <laughs> they're changing geographies. It is a it's a huge challenge. It's hard to 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 lay down any roots. And with what our what our what our clients tell us, if I may refer to them as clients, what our what the youth who we serve tell us is, uh, among other things, one of the great values they receive in their in the mentoring relationship, is that most of the time their mentor is the only adult in their life who isn't getting paid to, you know, talk to them or help them. And so just building a stable relationship with a, with an adult who can help you navigate, you know, whether it's trying to go to the school prom or more practical things like bank accounts and whatever. The last thing I'll say is when you reach the age of 18, you're out. That's it. So find a place to live. It's yeah. You're thrown into adulthood. So, you can uh, you can imagine, and and people listening to this podcast also I think can't imagine the myriad of challenges that that these young people have to have to navigate, you know, daily and weekly and and annually. So it's a it's a it's an organization that I've worked with for many years. It's near and dear to my heart, and um, I like to say it's a it's an organization that punches way above its weight class. We have an annual operating budget of a uh, two and a half million dollars, roughly, mm-hmm. and um, the the reach and impact that we have on this population is is uh, pretty dramatic. So, um, it, it's an unmet need uh, to serve these folks, and uh, obviously brings a lot of uh, satisfaction to understand the you know the real world impact we have on yeah. these kids um and as i say they're they're frequently and easily overlooked yeah and then what happens after 18 does silver lining mentoring help in some way in ways they can uh, yeah i mean typically the um you know the formal mentoring relationship uh, we'll go through 18 and then sort of informally we'll continue. I mean, we've certainly got mentors and mentees who the, you know, the mentee is 23, 24, 25 years old. Now they're growing into adulthood and they typically are much wiser, <laughs> much more mature than, than their age would indicate given what they've had to navigate in life. And these relationships um, continue on. Oh, that's good. That's great. And then, 
Um, how do we help? How do we best help uh, silver lining mentoring? Those that are listening. Well, uh, among other things, I would visit the website silverliningmentoring.org. Uh, it is a, you know, a qualified uh, 503c charitable organization. Um, if if somebody is potentially interested in becoming a mentor, um, there are all sorts of links on the website to uh, learn more about that. And uh, of course, there's opportunities to just to donate funds, which go a long way. Um, I just wrote down the um, website, silverliningmentoring.org. Yep. We'll mention that a number of times, and then I'll make sure it gets in the, in the show notes. And then when it comes to donations, how, what kind, what's a good year for donations that you, the, the, the group? Uh... Yeah, so I'm the head of the finance committee, so I, I, I do have these uh, numbers relatively close at hand. We do an annual gala. Uh, that you know, we hope to raise sort of three hundred and fifty to four hundred thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. So that that's a big one. When is the annual gala? I beg your pardon. When is the annual gala? Uh, that's in uh, in May. So that one that one we just had that one. Obviously during COVID it was a little trickier. We had to experiment with uh, you know remote type of Zoom galas, but we're back to uh, back to in person. Thank thank goodness. Yeah. Um, so the gala raises a lot of money. We we certainly get plenty of um, you know sort of serendipitous donations. People you know send money at, at year end or or over the course of the year. We do have um, uh, a few very large uh, foundations that have provided us uh, grants for some um, uh, specific uh, projects. And um, we also received um, a, a two million dollar gift from um, uh, the I can't believe I'm forgetting her name, the spouse of Jeff Bezos, who was going around sort of giving money. Oh, um, yeah. uh, and and she she gave us a very generous gift. This is a what she is doing is um, Melinda Gates. No, no. Uh, Oh my goodness! That's just, I'm having a brain cramp here. I'm gonna. Oh, Bezos, right? His yeah. Wife. I forgot. Um, <laughs> Mackenzie Scott. Know. My gosh, I'm embarrassed. Mackenzie Scott is her name. Mackenzie Scott. Yeah. Yes. Uh, she <laughs> has. Um, <laughs> she she basically has an or you know her organization and her charitable giving goes around and identifies organizations that are of. Uh, uh, you know, sort of meet their criteria. You don't ask her for money. You don't ask for more money. <laughs> you, they call you. And we were flabbergasted to receive a call from her uh, team a year and a half ago with a with a two million dollar. Here you go. And that, um, yeah. frankly, they did their research. They did their research, and it you know her 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 funds are uh, you know no strings attached, and it really changed the trajectory of. Uh, what we're capable of and what the 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 types of <laughs> how big we can think. Um, yeah. So yeah. we're starting some some new initiatives that are uh, we think can be pretty powerful. Um, and you know, but the, uh, we we like to talk about Mackenzie Scott's gift because it's it sort of demonstrate you know it's, she's not giving the money away without doing a very deep dive. Uh, you know, in terms of due diligence. And so we were, yeah. we were thrilled on a number of levels, obviously, including just the gift itself. Yeah, that's an honor. Congratulations. It, yeah. it speaks volumes about the work you're doing and about the integrity of the people. So. Well, and to, to be fair, you know, I'm, I'm a board member and on the executive committee and provide whatever um, help I can with strategic thinking and decision making and, I speak to the CEO with some frequency around um, various initiatives, but the reality is that the people really doing the work are the folks who work at, at SLM on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, you know, clinical counselors and you know program managers and grant writers and uh, folks who are doing the day-to-day. Are are the are the people to really laud? Um, just yeah. 
can't be more happy about what they do and the and the value they provide. And to the degree I can add a little bit of help here and there in terms of advice and counsel and, and being an active board member, you know, that's great. Yeah. Well, and how many people of the 4,000 you mentioned that are in foster care in Massachusetts would you estimate that, that Silver Lining has helped? So the direct uh, uh, mentoring uh, at any given time is in the c- couple of hundreds, and the indirect is, uh, you know, much larger than that. Um, we tend to be sort of greater Boston metro area uh, centric uh, in terms of um, our reach. Mm-hmm. We we also do lots of uh, what we call learn and earn sessions. So at, at, at these group homes, for example, we will go out and, and do uh, educational sessions that will will pay the will pay the youth in foster care to attend. So it's a way for them to uh, learn things and 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 get get a little money in their pocket. And again, a lot of it is around financial literacy, um, interviewing techniques getting a driver's license, navigating various, uh, whether it's government entities or issues at school, you know, uh, meeting with teachers, whatever the issues might be, but we're, we're, we try to provide um, help to them. And to the degree they are interested in a mentoring relationship, um, we, we work to facilitate that. As you might imagine, these this population of, of youth uh, are you know are vulnerable and so the level of screening we do in terms of identifying and and you know approving mentors is is pretty deep and pretty intensive um yeah. before we before we match before we match a mentor with a mentee yeah how do they mentor online or zoom or they, do they meet at some point? no they well we, what we ask is that at, at a minimum um uh, a mentor spend four hours a month with their mentee and it's sort of up to them to figure out the cadences, you know, is that, you know, once a, you know, a couple hours every other weekend, or is it, you know, a Sunday afternoon, that's an, you know, an entire day once a month. And that's, there's no right answer to that. That's uh, sort of as, as needed. Yeah. So um, I have an idea. I met Ali Horiat. I'm going to introduce you to him. He started a group. Um, he sold a, a, a company. It was a startup. He made a lot of money, and he started a group called the Compass- Compassionistas. Compassionistas, and um, he's talking about very similar things to what you're talking about. And, and he was a match for the podcast as well because I'm talking to people about doing good, and that that makes a difference. And that's why we're here. We're not here to fight with each other and argue and disagree because one person thinks it one way and we'd like to change their mind. I don't know how much of that works anyway, but to appreciate each other, right? There's differences for a reason. And he's working for the same goal. Uh, I put him in touch with Bonton Farms in Texas. They're taking felons and taking people out of prison Uh, when they get out and they put them to work on the farm and they teach them about the business and they have a a lot of different programs on the farm. And that was started by a guy I know, Darren Babcock. And they're making tremendous progress, a few hundred people at a time. That's how life works, right? I mean, I, I, Um, I I often think about the show, The Millionaire, when I was a kid and you only saw the back of the millionaire's head and he would give his his right-hand man, the, the job to go out and give people, people, individuals, a million dollars. He would search for people that had done good and were making differences in other people's lives and were struggling themselves. But they, no one knew. No one knew for sure, right? But what they were doing was making a difference in the world. And then, the, and then of course, the end of the show, these people got a million dollars. I'm sure most of them did good, but it was a TV show. My point is that they were doing good, and we we don't hear much about that today. We don't hear much. No, and I, you know, so my wife Lynn has been uh, was a, so I, we live in Needham, Massachusetts, which is a affluent Boston suburb, and she has been involved in the Needham Community Council for many years, and and just finished up a 
uh, being the president of the community council for the last two years. And what was uh, uh, shocking is too strong of a word. What was very surprising to me, just as an example, is that the Needham Community Center has a, has a food pantry. And if you drove around Needham, you'd look at a lot of expensive houses and, you know, fancy cars and whatnot, and, and not understand that there is a meaningful amount of food insecurity, even in the town in which we live. And um, the Needham Community Council does a whole lot of other stuff be, besides that in terms of um, helping, the, helping just the town of Needham. And the, the point of this story is, is for people that uh, are, are thinking of what they can do or how they can contribute or whatever, I, you know, money's nice. And, it, you know, it was kind of easy, right, to just donate to organizations. That's great. Uh, right in your backyard, I am certain that there is a need uh, for all sorts of ways that one can volunteer and, and help. Um, and, uh, and, you know, many, many towns have community councils whose objective, they're, they're what their, <laughs> their charter is to provide resources to the community that aren't met by, uh, by other means. And, and whether that's a food pantry or, um, you know, hand-me-down work clothing, or uh, uh, you know, English as a second language classes. In fact, my wife got involved initially teaching English as a second language to folks who either in, in Needham, if you live or work in Needham and you would like free you know, one-on-one -on -one English as a second language tutoring, the Needham Community Council will provide that. Become a language tutor. I, you know, there, there's there's no shortage of ways to help people. Is there, that's really what I'm trying to say, uh, saying yeah. it in a long in a long winded way. Well, I think the bigger point too was was that in wealthy communities. Now, I have a daughter who lives in Norwell, and I have a daughter who lives in Rentham, and uh, the, they're pretty affluent communities. Norwell probably more so than Rentham, but still, they're they're. But both of them are for sure, absolutely. Both are for sure, and. Um, I know there's a Franklin food pantry because I do support it, uh, but but I don't know that there is in Rentham or in in Norwell. So I'll be talking to my daughters about that. That uh, the big point was is that we're unaware of it. Most people are unaware, unaware of it. it. Yep. There's a lot of need that simply could be uh, helped by spending a few hours at the food pantry once a week or twice a week. Yeah, and help them organize. It, it, maybe enroll neighbors to bring, to get food together, and then go there once a week with food. That's that's uh, besides silver lining mentoring. You know, that's a thought that I think for all of us listening uh, to consider: where can we actually get active and help? Because it is easy to write a check. Yeah, fact, and uh, you know, would, wouldn't hard. wouldn't discourage anybody from doing so, but to, to yeah. you know, to the degree you know you want to get involved, there's no, uh, it, 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 you know, pick your topic. <laughs> well, let's see if we can get people involved in uh, interested in being a mentor for Silver Lining Mentoring, and uh, to make a donation if they can, if, especially if they're of the means to make a donation. And probably you take uh, fifty bucks or ten bucks. Or we whatever. listen. Uh, every everything goes uh, a long way. We'll, um, you know, we hand out uh, to mentees. We'll give them, you know, a, a prepaid card for you know for food, <laughs> uh, yeah. you know, for groceries. Sometimes it's, it's you know some of these mentees are trying to live on their own. Um, wow. We'll give them a tea pass so that they can get back and forth to things like, you know, these these kids are on a, you know, do not have a lot of financial resources. And we run a very tight ship and, um, you know, a, a $50 donation is uh, going to go a long way to helping helping a couple of kids out. Might help someone over a, a short term uh, challenge. Right. And. Uh, if you have those kind of donations, you, you, you have the means to help those kids. For, absolutely. So let's remind them it's silver lining mentoring dot org. Yep. Silver lining mentoring dot org. I hope you folks go to the show notes. So 
I don't have to spell it. And then um, the annual gala is going to come again in May. Where will it be held? On the North Shore in Massachusetts? Uh, we've held it in Boston at the uh, uh, Cyclorama, it's called. It's this old uh, old building that I think was like a roller skating rink in, you know, 90 years ago. <laughs> um I don't know that we, I don't know that we have the either the date or the venue uh, okay. chosen just yet for the right. 2025 uh, gala. People go to the website; they'll get information as it's posted, and can they make a donation to support the gala without yeah. having to to go? Oh sure, yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, if people are really interested in the mission and what we're doing, uh, there's you can sign up for an email distribution of just you know news. <laughs> And then um, they can buy tickets. I'm sure at some point they'll find it on the website. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I might like to go myself next year, depending on the timing. I do travel up once a month and I'm in Beverly and then I'm in Norwell and then I'm in Rentham. You might connect the reasons why there. I see my grandchildren and my daughters, but in Beverly, I do a little bit of work at the coming center and uh, enrolling people that I coach and leadership and sales training, the work that I do. But the most important work is helping people overcome their small-minded thinking. That's what I talk about. My, my passion and purpose is to raise the consciousness of humanity one person at a time. We have to stop making each other wrong. Monday morning quarterbacking is easy. And it's become a sport. And I want people to question that and to learn to appreciate all the differences. That somewhere with a dialogue, there's a compromise. That should be the goal, to have the belief that it's my way or the highway or our way or the highways. It's not healthy. And I think we can see that more than ever. And that's the purpose of it. The good in it is to get people to question their own answers. And that's the work that I'm doing. Now, Peter, anything else you want to share with us? Well, uh, I, 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 one of the reasons we got connected, Steve, is some challenges I'm dealing with in, in my own life that have uh, led to a lot of reflection around uh, what I like to call the wake that you leave behind. If you know, if your life is, uh, if you're the boat <laughs> and your life is the boat cruising along, what kind of wake do you want to leave um, behind you? I have to and, have Paul share with you the book that he wrote the questions for me on Wake Up, Jump Into Your Life. And the question on the cover was, there was a boat, and what is the wake you were leaving? <laughs> okay. Well, couldn't have set it up any better. It was uh, serendipity. I did not know that. Um, and it's, uh, anyway, the, I'm dealing with a, uh, a health challenge that's degenerative in nature and is... Uh, you know, uh, it's a motor neuron disease that will, uh, you know, do me in eventually, uh, to put it in sort of blunt terms. And that has led to a whole lot of uh, reflection around uh, just existential reflection and what's important in life and dealing with the fear and anxiety associated with a diagnosis that's uh, not really treatable and is going to get worse um, progressively. And to come to grips with um, that reality, and uh, I think I've done a pretty good job getting to a point that you and I talked about before we turned on the tape around gratitude and appreciation for um, what we have, and uh, trying to minimize any anger or anxiety about uh, you know, what m bad things that might happen in the future. And, t you know, talking with our friend Paul, for example, uh, who's kind of helped me with, on the one hand, which seems like kind of a simple um, idea is, uh, but easier said than done is, you know, don't worry about the things that haven't happened yet. And I've got a lot of things to worry about uh, relative to things that will happen. And I am, I'm trying to shorten my, my uh, outlook in terms of how far out into the uh, uh, future I'm looking and look a little closer down at my feet and, and appreciate each day. And I think it's um, 
I mean, I've been reminding my good friends of all the things in life that w whether it's relationships or work issues or whatever, I encourage folks to sort through those list of things, whatever they might be, and be really, really uh, uh, specific around which of those actually matter and which of them don't. And the ones that don't, chuck them to the side. And the ones that do, you know, deal with it. And if it's whether it's relationships or things that you've always wanted to do that you haven't done, it doesn't have to be about, you know, negative things. It can be, you know, I've been putting such and such off. I'll do it. I'll do it later. Um, well, you know, there may not be a later, right? And obviously your history is, uh, <laughs> yeah, you can talk about that as well as anybody having a, you know, a health experience that could have taken your life easily, maybe should have taken your life. Somehow you'd managed not to. Um, yeah. You just, there's no guarantees. And I, I, I'm a former college athlete, healthy as a horse. And until one day uh, I wasn't. And um, you have to, to, to the degree you can, uh, hopefully that doesn't happen to anybody else, but to the degree you can kind of live spiritually and, and uh, mentally sort of appreciating the moment and, and keep being a little less focused on the, you know, the distant future, uh, that's something I would highly encourage. Yeah. Well, you shared with me being angry and I can tell you, I was angry before my health challenge. I was angry at the, this license I had bought, making myself wrong for buying it. I didn't like what they were teaching or the method they were teaching. I liked a lot of it. I learned a lot. I didn't like the role play and they were, what I found is my clients were getting, uh, they were losing their authenticity. They were, I had a few call me whispering saying, Hey, what do you say when the client says this? Like, why are you whispering? Oh, wait, I took a break. I went in the bathroom, said I had to go to the bathroom. Get back in there and answer the question and or help them figure out if you're a good fit. You know, instead of wondering, what do you say? They had, they were in their head. So I knew I wanted to get rid of it, but I was stuck in how really I was stuck in how, and how's not our job in the universe. And, um, I was actually asking the creator, for me it was God at the time, to, you know, show me the way. I don't know how to get the hell out of this. Who will buy my own work? I had all that ranting going on, right? This is what I call the acorn brain. And I was angry. I was angry before. And um, it's not healthy for us either way. Angry in something, angry back, looking back, angry looking forward. We really only have our breath, right? And there's a gift in every breath. And uh, I think, Peter, you said to me that it certainly wasn't on your calendar, right? What's upcoming? And, and, and it wasn't on mine, right? I was doing, I was in the middle of a, of a training and, and needed an ambulance. So the point is for all of us to get to the place where you appreciate each day. Maybe you get up and say, this is a fantastic day because we don't know. And, and yeah, you've heard it from other people. You've heard it from plenty of people, I'm sure. The thing is, when you can appreciate the moment that you have, it makes a difference to those around you. You're the one changing. That's who it impacts. And Peter, you have moose laying by your feet. It's funny you named him moose because I have a friend of mine who has, I think he's probably eight or nine months old, a black lab that he named moose. <laughs> well, the, uh, it's a good name. I'll, let me just uh, grab my camera for a second, give you a little bit of a look. Yeah, is he, uh, where is he? There he is. Moose. He looks just like Moose in New Hampshire. <laughs> he's, uh, he's doing what he does very well, which is taking a little snooze. <laughs> well, um, you're gonna, definitely going to get a viewer from uh, Steve Zaracotas who has Moose in New Hampshire. <laughs> so what's the last message you'd like to leave everybody with? Or maybe two, because you certainly want to mention silvermentoring.org again. Well, yeah, I mean, if uh, get it, get involved, uh, however you can with whatever you're interested in, and in the lack with the la uh, in the absence of a good idea, uh, silverliningmentoring.org is a great place to start. Yeah. Um, I, I guess I would say I've been I've been exploring ways to change my way of thinking. 
And I don't, uh, I'm going to use the word neuroplasticity, which I don't know that I'm qualified to actually talk that much about, but, um, you know, conceptually, it's a way to kind of rewire your brain a little bit and, and either learn new ways of thinking about things or uh, make, make changes. And I would have, uh, I don't know, a year ago at this time, the, the more cynical Pete might have uh, referred to this as sort of new age kind of nonsense, but uh, not anymore. And like waking up every day and thinking of a few things that you're grateful for in life uh, is a simple example <laughs> of a way to change your, change your thinking. And that's something I've been doing every day for the last month or so. I mean, it's relatively new. And it has, uh, it has, and many, many of the times it's a repeat, it's a repeat. You don't have to come up with three new ones every day necessarily, um, or, or come up with one, whatever, whatever works for you. But, uh, to the degree you can spend a couple of minutes reflecting on things you're grateful for, it will, it, it has changed my outlook on, uh, on life in a lot of ways. And um, that, I think that's an example of kind of training your brain to positivity. Yeah. Uh, Joe Dispenza calls it reminding ourselves. And then Dr. Um, Shirzad, I have his book here because I, I do some work for with them, the PQ coach uh, program. And, and this positive intelligence is Dr. Shirzad Shamin. He talks about, um, they did fMRIs with Stanford uh, when he when he thought about this program. He used to be the CEO of Coach Training Institute. I think Paul even was certified uh, there. And uh, anyway, they did fMRIs on people they had recruited who were mostly negative. They were looking for people who were mostly negative thinkers, and they found that a certain area of the, of the uh, neocortex lit up. And I it, don't hold me to the left or right, but let's call it the on the left side, uh, the negative neurons opened and fired with negative people. And they were very active as they gave people practices such as gratitude and 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 having a, 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 a pattern interrupt. Right. Whether it's breath, deep breathing or going for a walk by the beach, whatever can interrupt. meditation, <laughs> yoga. Meditation. Yeah. Plenty of ways to get there. Yeah, plenty of ways to get there. Go for riding a bike or walk around your office chair, but whatever breaks that for a moment, then to think about um, something positive and, and gratitude and blessings, uh, counting one's blessings were amongst the list of things he has. And um, what they found when they did fMRIs follow-ups was that they had opened up new neural pathways on the opposite side of the brain. Yeah. Which now they're, they're, I don't know if they've decided permanently, like it's, it's, it's proven, but that's where the positive neurons were stored, that the brain was opening up new pathways, much like a stroke victim. Uh, when they lose certain yeah. motor functions or even speech or some of the other things, over time as they go through rehab, yeah, the brain them. finds new ways. Totally, uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's. I think there is plenty of clinical research to support that um, through a variety of means. I mean, you see it in in um, all, all the psychedelic uh, treatments that are being experimented with, it, whether it's MDMA or psilocybin or ketamine treatments that are very, very helpful for. Uh, a, a, a number of reasons, I think, predominantly uh, utilized now with uh, folks suffering with uh, PTSD, for example, oh, okay. um, a way to kind of deal with trauma and uh, process it and move forward productively. Um, this fa is a fascinating topic, and I, I don't know really know what the hell I'm talking about, other than I've I've, I've thought about it and experienced it a little bit, but. Um, uh, certainly, you know, the scientific and neurologic community and psychiatric community, you know, has a lot to say about it. I think, too, the, um, the power of intention. So I'm going to ask the audience to hold wonderful, positive intentions for Peter 
in his journey and um, to continue to hold that intention for him uh, that uh, the synchronicities of people that have different ideas and different ways to approach what he's going through uh, will reach him, right? And the, 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 inner, the universe has an amazing way. Someone said that synchronicities are God's way of staying anonymous. And um, <clears throat> hopefully you have some amazing synchronicities. We want that for you. I'm definitely going to be on the bandwagon for silver, silver, silver lining mentoring.org. I want everyone who's listening to get on it. I'm going to connect you with a few people that I think can help you and would be interested to help you. I'll do that by email. One of them is the guy that started Compassion, Compassion, Compassionistas or Compassion Vistas, but you'll, you'll get to meet Ali Horiat, who's, who's really working to do good in society and wants to change the mindset. And that's how we met. So, um, I'll connect you there and, and, uh, We'll stay in touch because I want to. I want to talk further about ways I can. I can help. Well, thank you very much for having me on. It was an interesting conversation. You're welcome. You're welcome. God bless you in your journey. Um, I don't know who that is for you. For me, it's the Creator of the universe. Uh, but whatever anyone believes, as I've said many times on these podcasts, is it's fine. It's wonderful that you believe. Don't make others wrong because they don't believe what you believe. Right. Think about the small mind <laughs> that is. All right, folks. Whatever is small minded does not come from what made a universe that we still haven't figured out. Think about it. All right, everybody. Have a good and Peter, thank you again. Thank you. I'm grateful. Grateful we met and grateful to Paulo. Thank you. Bye. You're welcome.